Hey, it's Lauren, and in today's video, I'm speaking with Dom Damaski, who is a publisher of Motivation Champs, publishing all kinds of nonfiction books, including memoir. And I'm just so we had such a great conversation, mostly surrounding the craft of writing, what publishers look for, uh, common pitfalls that authors and writers alike face. So if you're into that kind of thing, I think you're really going to get a lot out of this video. So without delaying things any further, let's go ahead and get right into it. I'm introducing Dom Damaski. Thank you for being here. And uh doing something kind of fun and cool like this with me. I, I, I appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> oh, I enjoy it. Why don't you tell me or tell everyone, I guess, a little bit of who you are, what you do, and maybe how you found your way into the book publishing space, because that's so particular. And I'm always interested to hear how people find their way into that. Very into unique. Anybody finding their way. I'm 40 <laughs> some years old and I'm not sure I've uh, found my way anywhere yet. I am searching and, and for anybody out there, it's okay to be uh, on this path. The path is not linear. It's winding. It's up. It's down. Years ago, I had a business. I went broke, lost half a million dollars. I was in my 20s. I was reading Norman Vincent Peale and Joel Osteen and Jeffrey Gittimer and John C. Maxwell as I was trying to um, pull myself up. You know, it wasn't a good time. Things stunk. I, I yeah, almost yeah. sit on the curb a lot of days and cry out in front of my restaurant. But I, I would read these books and they, it helped me get through those times and it helped me start over. And I started to think that I had something to say. It was more about getting beat up or going broke or mm -hmm. uh, not being so great at things. And so I, I started writing my first book and it took seven years. I wasn't any good at it. And I made every mistake there that you could possibly make. So looking back at it, it was underdeveloped. I gave it my best for who I was at the time. And so I learned the mistakes I made with publishers that were uh, preying on my hopes and dreams and just pushing me through the process. And people started to ask me how I did it or I'd be speaking and they'd tell me a story. And I'd say, hmm, mm -hmm. that person has a story. That person has a story. This person's asking me how they could write a book and I thought I'll help them and, that, and that, that's that's how it all started and so the company's motivation champs we as many ways as we can try to help people share their story in different ways that's awesome so is it mostly nonfiction that you work with or memoirists or do you do you also do a little bit of fiction? nonfiction memoirs it I say it has to do the world better good in some way so I live in this world of inspiration and positivity so if somebody has a story, whether it's a children's book, whether it's a graphic novel, whether it's a memoir, we just try to get them out to the world. So that it just has the caveat is <laughs> I I am not your person for murder mysteries or uh, yeah. uh, romance novels. I, I guess it could be positive, but it's it's not for it's not what I understand. I have kind of a soft spot for fiction because or for uh, memoir because I feel like I tend to be really really picky about the stories that I read and yeah. I think for something that's nonfiction like a memoir it's so much easier for it to have like a natural kind of depth to it because you know that it's true like it's all yeah. real when you're mm -hmm. reading it um so I think that's so great that that's kind of like you know the point that you really try to bring out with the books that you that you acquire from and these you, writers you as you as well yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I guess a follow up question to that would be, what do you wish that authors or writers knew when working with someone like you as a publisher, which I'm sure that invites in a lot of different, you know, opinions and, and um, you know, thoughts on that. So anything that you have to share about that? Well, I'll go. I'll, you can cut me off at any time and mute the recording. <laughs> or uh, It's all good. This guy, went, this guy went on for way too long. The first thing I think is it's your book, your baby, it's your dream. So never let anybody, take one, take the rights. That's a whole different story, but mm -hmm. it's yours. You own it. Now, that being said, you should also, if you are hiring somebody you believe that you trust or working with somebody, uh, you believe them them enough to want to partner with them. You should believe in them enough to, when they say, maybe we need to develop this here, or you... You're, I'm not sure you want to say this, or this is getting a little long. Uh, you should trust in them that way too. You believed in them; they believe in you. It's for the better good. So uh, those would be two that I will start off with. Do you feel like you kind of see some of that possessiveness with authors more often than not, where it's like, "This is my book. This is what I want to see," and like, 
kind of almost being shut off to some of that constructive criticism? This will, I'm going to go direct to our, our, our storytellers here. The earlier they are in the career, the, in their writing journey, the more possessive they are. Mm. They wrote it in a, it's so close to their heart a lot of times. And that's what they're holding on to. Yeah. They're holding on to this story that's close to their heart that I'm giving you a piece of me. Nobody's trying to take that piece of you away. Mm -hmm. We're trying to improve it, make it better. You write how you're feeling that day, but that's not a story. You wrote based on that day. And mm -hmm. now you need to look at it from up in the sky and say, okay, does this chronologically, does this take, like if you're looking at a memoir, a memoir would start with an incident or a point in their life and build to a crescendo. And then, mm -hmm. so the same with, uh, when you're writing in that process. So the answer, yes, to think that I wrote it first and it's perfect the way it is, it just, it isn't true. Oh my gosh. I have so many supplemental questions to follow everything that you just said. And I loved hearing all of it too. And it reminds me of a, a quote that I heard from Stephen King. I don't know if you've heard it either, which is that it starts with you, but ends with the reader. And I feel like that's sometimes where some of that disconnect happens, where it's like, it's your story because it happened to you or for you, however you want to look at it, you know, assuming it's a memoir and it's taking that vision and like translating it in a way that's going to access other people where they're at because there's those elements of relatability or they can like yeah. see themselves wow. in your challenges and in your story. And it's so hard from like the perspective of a memoir is to just not get so sucked into like the black hole that are the vignettes. And then, cause it's like, you get those little spotlights and it's like okay but where's the greater narrative like where's the greater arc it's so how do you know when you're working with a author how do you know who the end user the end client is the reader how, yeah. where is the point where you say but the reader it, yeah but we're grinding through this or but you already said that how do you manage that like my my opinion is that you should ideally know your target person or audience before you write the book because I feel like mm -hmm. that naturally helps shape some of the direction and especially the language too because yeah. you already have someone in mind that that you're writing the book for and that's that's a trick that I've heard from other authors too is that like I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert she wrote um Eat Pray Love that best selling book from like 2004 or whatever and she said that her trick was that she was writing her book literally to a specific person yeah. like it was initially meant to be a letter and then it turned into like this whole book and then it sold millions of copies and stuff and I think it's important to know either the audience or even more ideally the person within the audience like the tree within the forest that you can just write it too because it's for you like you're getting it out of you and into the world but you're also balancing that with knowing that someone else on the other end with a face is yeah. absorbing everything that you say so that's my personal opinion one thing that that's just pause for a second for uh, yeah. the people that are writing the books and it, it crosses between the marketing too here is sometimes people will say that your target market is you. If you're looking for an avatar, it's you. And then the next step of that is it's you before you had it all figured out. So mm -hmm. not that any of us really do, but, but you before you had it all figured. So you're speaking to you and you needed that information. You needed this help. You needed these business tips. You needed to learn how to tie your, the bait on a rod or whatever, whatever you are talking about, they need you. You're talking to them at an earlier point in the journey. You got to make sure that the target market you're looking for can handle what you're writing mm -hmm. because whether it's bad grammar content or anything, if at any point the reader has to close the book, whether that's big words, they got to go look up, mm -hmm. whether that's content that's abrasive, they might not pick your book back up. I've gone this uh this Socrates Socrates three questions lately. Yeah. Is it good? Is it helpful? Is it true? It, yeah. This makes me think of that. Okay, does this book help? Is it is it current? All those things. They, absolutely. So if someone was like, I I meet a lot of people, and I'm sure you do too, where they find out what you do, you know, you publish books or you market books or whatever. And then, you know, it opens up the discussion of like, oh, well, you know, I've actually been thinking about writing a book and, oh, it's just so much work. So like, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I don't know how it all works. So is there anything, a piece of advice, words of wisdom, a starting point, a checklist for what you would offer to people who are at the stage where they're curious about writing the book and they're asking a lot of those what if questions, but they yeah. haven't necessarily executed on it yet? Well, we could go on this subject 
for we could have, start a whole yeah. new <laughs> a series every every day forever. So That's one, true. just do it. Start writing. What are you passionate about? Well, how do I start writing? Okay, it can be that rudimentary. Whether it's a notebook, whether it's Google Docs, whether it's Word. Like, okay, like some people say, oh, I just want to write a book. Well, why? Yeah. I want to write a book. Why? What are you passionate about? So to this goal that I want to write a book, I don't like that unless you know why you want to write a book. I want to write a book because I have a message of I overcame this and I think I could help people. I want to write a book because I use this formula to become a successful business leader. I want to write a book because I flip houses and I think this could help other people. Okay. Is your why really pure? Because if it's pure, no matter how hard, no matter how long, you'll fight through it. I would also say that that really, really helps with marketing too, at least from my perspective, because those are always, it's always the super basic questions that I'm asking people. If I'm ever working with someone one-on-one, -on -one, it's like, okay, let's talk about it. Like, not only what are your goals, but like, what are you wanting to do all of this for? And yeah. also like, what's, what's unique about your book? Because that's going to help access the right people where they're at and giving them the stuff that they really yeah. need to hear in that moment. Yeah. Why are you qualified to write about what you're writing about. I'm a mother, that I'm a caregiver, that I've, I'm a lawyer that studied this. I'm a scientist that studies this. I went through it myself. I've done, but you have to be qualified mm -hmm. in some way. And I'm not saying letters after your name, whether mm -hmm. it's experience or letters after your name, or that you've done a lot of research on the subject or read hundreds of books or that mm -hmm. you're good at riding bikes. I have a author that talks a lot about she rode her bike across Africa many times. She competes. And so when she wants to talk about riding bikes, you know, and inter introducing that into mental health, Kathy Judson, it's uh, it works because she's been there. She's done it. I think with um, at, at least my thoughts on this is that with people with a lot of letters and credentials and stuff after their name, they went to Harvard, they have a PhD, whatever. I think a lot of the magic in, some, in someone like that is creating a very accessible and easy to digest kind of book because you have so much knowledge and expertise to share that it's not going to land at all if you're using a lot of these technical terms, kind of like what you were saying earlier, where it's like, you know, that might be great for an academic. It might be someone great for someone within your profession. But if you're trying mm -hmm. to tell a story about how you did X, Y, Z, I think it's really easy to kind of shift into like work mode or like academic mode and no. just kind of like ooze prestige without it actually landing anywhere. Using simple words to create something or communicate something really great just makes it even more unique and even more powerful. I would start with this on that subject. Mm -hmm. It's all about story. So yeah. stories are what people connect with. So we can have all the facts and figures. I like facts and figures in a lot of mm -hmm. books. I need facts and figures to back up what you're saying. I need right. I need the Harvard study. I need the case studies. I need, I get it. But it starts with story to connect. Take mm -hmm. me on this journey. Tell me why I should care. Tell me why you're passionate about it. And so everybody gets it. Everybody can connect with that. So what are these common bonds that people can connect with then to if you want to use the facts and figures or the big yeah, words? But all this stuff on these big words, let's just sidebar here, that a lot of people want to use these big words. They don't always fit because now, now if you're forcing me to look up this word mm -hmm. and I go look it up, it better fit. Because now I'm saying you, didn't even use, you made me look up the word and it isn't even the correct usage of the word. So that that's yeah. frustrating. Or when you see these million dollar words that seem crowbarred in yeah. and now you see it three times in the chapter, four times in the chapter from a uh, from a publisher side of the view. But I will often uh, check the PDF document. And once I get a word like that, I'll go right into find all and see mm -hmm. how many times it was used and say, if you use this or this example this many times, 111 times. We use this in this amount of pages. So I feel like, oh, go ahead. You go ahead. You look yeah, like so, you're going to say something. So for people writing, whether you're pitching or anything, at, from this side, people are looking at that kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's a turnoff. So when mm -hmm. I'm analyzing your document, when I'm reading through it with my team, something mm -hmm. I pick up on. I feel like the first thing you want to do is make an apathetic reader curious. And I feel like the last thing you want to do is suck them out of the book once you get them there. <laughs> and uh, a great way to do that is with you know, some of those common errors that, that you might come across with, with your work. 
I love the art of the story. I feel like it's a it's a dance, and the dance there is there is, it's uh, you know ups and downs of it, and you're taking them on a emotional ride. So I believe in story structure that whether you're writing a memoir, it should go like this. You should take me, and there's so many ways. Like let's say a Netflix, when you watch a show on Netflix. Netflix will dump you right into the story. It's common to their story structure. Mm-hmm. Every episode, they dump you right in. You see something going on, and then they'll take you back. It's almost every show on Netflix is, is done on that same structure. Mm-hmm. It works for them. And so when you're writing a book, you can see, like, a memoir incident, what then it takes me. Or if you're going chronologically, chronologically, it could be some kind of thing that happened early. And now I'm showing you my growth throughout. Is there like a question that I've come across or that people have asked me and that I've also wondered myself is like, especially in the case of memoir, when you're writing it or when you're crafting it, how do you know when you're when you're sharing too much or how do you know when you're maybe over explaining something? And at least my response to that is it always needs to serve a purpose for the reader. If you're putting something in to make yourself feel better, I would say it's probably not necessary if it doesn't immediately contribute to the story or educate the reader on something. So I'd be curious, like kind of what your thoughts are on that. I had an author one time and something traumatic happened in the, in this, in the story. And there was almost like a chase. And then the author went into the detail of the car that they were driving what was on the radio, how they were positioned in the car, the type of seats in the car. Now, something traumatic is happening. Yeah. And I, as a reader, want to have a resolution over what is going on. The pause at this heated moment that is an awkward pause doesn't make sense. how How did pausing at that point to tell me about something that we, if you were saying, like sometimes they'll call it um, Hitch, Hitchcock's time bomb, where they, <laughs> sh- they show you something in a room that mm-hmm. we can see, or they'll drop something in a room, and now we're going to go back to that car later on because that was important. Mm-hmm. But if you go away from something that doesn't take the story forward right then, it's uh, maddening. Well, because it's like you're reading like such a high stakes scene or part of the book like who cares what the chair looks like i want to know what happens yes, like, yeah, right. unless unless there's foreshadowing or it's symbolic in some kind of way but in that case i would say you know place it somewhere else except for in the middle of the traumatic event that's happening either before or after you dropped in you took me out you opened up something that i really would like to know about like mm-hmm. did you like uh, why did you bring this in is it because this person influenced your life in some way is it because in this moment you were there it didn't go anywhere it was just crowbar the name crowbar the, that uh, oh i want to show people how many people i know i want to show people how smart i am i want to show people all these things that don't move the story forward it didn't help the reader like sometimes it's it's so easy for your nose to get super close to the painting to see yep. the whole picture. And I think either, you know, like beta readers or a writer's group or an editor or something like that it c- can be so valuable because it's like, okay, here's where you drop the ball. Here's where you're giving me too much. You, you, introdu- you introduced this and you never circled back to it. Like, I, I want to know what that is. There, it's just, I, I feel like it's such a specific kind of craft that not many people realize how difficult it is until they're in it and they're writing it themselves because everyone thinks that they can write a book and then it's like, Mm -hmm. give it a go, see what you learn, you know? Right. And I I would encourage everybody to go for it. Yeah. But if I was, if I was going to spend money, even as a publisher of books, I would say spend your money at some point in the process on an editor first, make sure there's, make sure your work is edited and developed. And then, then you can do all the things and make, Hopefully you find publishing companies that would edit and things like that. But to think you're going to do it with no editing, please don't. Please. Mm-hmm. I'll speak directly. Please don't. It's a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. If you have a poorly edited book, you're done. You know, if it's a story, mm-hmm. you're done. Because they'll, they'll, they'll get through, they'll, they'll open it, they'll read one page and be like, this is terrible. I'm bored. Mm-hmm. I would say if there's anything to invest in out of pocket, you know, or or to, you know, communicate with your publisher about, it would be, Awesome editing and an awesome book cover. <laughs> right. When I see ones made on like uh, 
like clip art and yeah, 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 right. It's it's very clear. It's not professional. And then so some people say, I'm going to do it myself. I'm gonna get I'll design my own cover wall. They were great at engineering, not designing covers. They were great at uh however they became successful. So to cut corners, you risk having an inferior product that goes out to the market and then people are like, I thought this guy was an expert in right whatever it was and now i see this book i question yeah whether he's an expert in the other thing so mm -hmm. you guys a lot of times if you put out an inferior product you can actually do your everybody thinks that it's yeah. going to benefit their brand if it's good if it, if it stinks mm -hmm. it's going to do harm to your brand and that's that's mm -hmm. what you're I feel like, yeah, you risk you risk losing credibility if you kind of cut corners in that way. It's like, oh, I thought you were like this person with an awesome story or this person w with a lot of knowledge to share. And yeah. your book doesn't really add up in that way, you know, yeah. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so I, I guess as we kind of start to wrap up of a, a more technical question is what is like your your editing process? If you're working with an author, someone comes to you, they have an awesome book on hand. You say yes to them. What does that process generally look like? The first thing I like to do is I, I have to see the manuscript, see the manuscript. You might have one page done. You might have 140,000 words cleanly edited that are put together. Once we are able to review that document, we know, oh, if like, I could have a beautiful conversation with you. It could be the greatest storyteller. And then you send me nine pages full of emojis. Although you were a great oral storyteller, when I got your document, it, it needs a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So that's the an, analyzing that document and seeing, okay, what does this need to take it to market? So some of this might be a little rough on your ex-wife, a little rough on your ex-husband, a little rough on society, mm -hmm. a little rough on whatever that be. So then it becomes a matter of development. We mm -hmm. would still have editors go over it. So now if we have the nine page one or the one page one, you have to figure out, do they mean, do they need development? Do they need coaching? Do they need to go back to the drawing board? Do they need resources mm -hmm. that would help them get where they want to go? Now, a general book that comes in, it's 40 to 50,000 words, 60,000 words, something like that. I think that's probably the, the sweet spot for memoirs and coaching type books in today's world. I'm always reviewing myself, but it takes a whole team of people finding who's the right fit for the right person. You know, I think that only good things can come, generally speaking, from, you know, seeking out that kind of support or hiring that kind of support, you know, whether it's editing or book cover design or getting a second pair of eyes on it or whatever. Um, so it sounds like you've got a really good team over there of people who only want the best for their, for their yeah, writers and authors. I, I believe in that. And when you select teammates, you find ones, not every, not every teammate along the way, fit the greater vision, but the ones that have mm -hmm. been around for years and years and years, and we keep adding members that have that same kind of um, want to make the stories a little better for the greater good. I love that so much. I think you're doing such great work out there and you're just only amplifying the stories that people want to tell, but maybe don't know how to tell it. So I think it's all good work that you're doing over there. If someone wanted to learn a little bit more about you or Motivation Champs, what's one of the first places you would you would want them to go to learn more? Wherever you want to go, we are trying to put out 24-7. I have a mission, 24-7, trying to put out inspiration, positivity, smiles, 24-7, and help other people do the same. So if you have a piece of content like that, or you believe in that kind of content, well, we'd love to have you part of our, part of our community. So you'll find pages and groups everywhere in it that are under Motivation Champs. And the website, if you are a person that wants to, share that kind of those kind of stories or write those kind of stories on the website you also find that motivation champs ways to connect and um, follow as well awesome well thank you so much for you know being a part of this conversation and i really hope that it helps some people i mean there's i love the conversation that we have only only good things thank you Likewise. <laughs>
Thank you so much for tuning in to today's video all about publishing, talking with Dom, getting a lot of really great conversations going. I really hope you got something out of it. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing by doing that. You're letting me know that you found it valuable, that you like it, that you want to get more content like this. And it also makes it easier for other people to find it who could also benefit from it as well. So feel free to do that. Be sure to check out Dom on all of his social media, on his website. Everything is going to be linked down below. Otherwise, that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next video. Take care until then. Bye.